like I said, I want to cover over Media Flight Plan 7 and 8 today. Some of the fr front half of these are really simple. The back half is uh, a little bit more difficult in this regard. And apologies, I'm trying to pull up some of the other stuff here. So the first thing I wanted to go over is we are still talking about our movie demographics. So you remember this little spreadsheet here. And so the first question that we're looking at actually refers to some of those index numbers that we've been promoting throughout the class. And so our first question is to assume your target is adults and prefer to see movies on opening weekend based solely on the index number, which has the greatest potential? Which this is very easy to, to, to do uh, in terms of going to adults and age range. So I'm just going to make sure I can find it. So looking at through the index numbers, and we want to look at C movie on opening weekend. And you can see I've already highlighted the answer, so I'm kind of giving it away in this case. But you'll notice, so 216, 133, 97 for ages 35 to 44, 76 for 45 to 54, 59, etc., etc. So we notice that the younger group in terms of our number at 216 has the greatest potential in this case. So that's important to recognize, but we also want to recognize um, going through this in terms of talking about some of these index numbers. We can also assess that ages 25 to 34 is also pretty significant in terms of um, a age range that we would want to pay attention to. So as noted, so this is number two here, uh, as noted, uh, it often makes sense to collapse multiple target groups into a single audience. You've noticed that while using the media flight plan uh, software that you have combined age ranges for adults in this case. And so you can recognize within 18 to, to 34 um, is what we have in this regard. So they said, what's the next best demo? And we've got our ages 25 to 34. We know this solely based on the index number of 133. I'm going to go ahead and apologize because there's a ambulance rolling around here. So I hope it doesn't cut too much into the audio. So our index numbers here are 216 and 133. But if we wanted the weighted total of um, projected users within this target audience, we could use these numbers of 4982 and 4314. In terms of tar talking about this target audience, okay, ambulance has has passed, <laughs> and so you'll notice again within question two, you uh, see it on my spreadsheet, but it gets into just over nine million persons for the new target of these combined. So this is something that you might do if you're looking at a particular data sheet in this regard, and I think we have another ambulance truck coming or something. Again, apologies, everybody. Okay. <laughs> this is the problem with having ADD. You, you tend to get caught up on some of these noises that are coming right outside your window since I'm right on River Street. All right. So, so that would be for number two is those combined. So let's stay on the prefer to see movie on opening weekend and they want us to look at the demo sets that are not employed, professional, managerial, uh, employed other, etc., and looking at the index numbers of loans based on five, uh, five occupations, name those first two occupations in those demo, group, demo groups, uh, providing the greatest potential based on index numbers. Mouthful. <laughs> Mouthful to say. So we're staying on opening weekend, and we notice a couple things here. First and foremost is our demo groups in terms of employed, professional managerial, sales, crafts, and employed. And we notice our two groups based on index number alone are 134 and 115. So those are our highest for the best demo groups here. But they also reference a third. And this one's really important. So if you look at number three, um, problem B, 
you'll notice here that they said a third demo group could be included even though it has a lower index. Which one? And explain why. And you'll see I've already highlighted it. So it's professional managerial at 94. So as a general rule within index numbers, we want to stay at 100 and above. And so this is at 94. You'll also notice one of them is at 80. The other one is at 93. 94 is not that bad. And it's pretty close. But it, it usually means that it's one that you wouldn't use in this case. However, you notice the vertical number based on the percentages that we have on preferred to see a movie on opening weekend based on occupation, that it is 19%. So that's about a fifth of our overall market. So that may be something that we want to include uh, as well as sales and the unemployed segment here. So that's three. Four gets into uh, something a little bit different because they basically say of people with a set of household index numbers. So household income is what we're looking at here. And we can see it right here. And they want you to find the index numbers. So 72, 70, 83, 90, 101, 106, and 119, 123. So I like to plug that in within my index numbers here. So I'll show you what I did here. So somebody was very creative enough to put this in an Excel spreadsheet, which kudos to you for doing that. Uh, because I like it when people put things in Excel. It makes it easier for me to grade in some regards. Uh, not discrediting anybody who didn't use Excel. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I do appreciate you uh, taking the time to work in Excel. And the reason is, is because this makes graphs very easy. So you could have put this in the book and that is perfectly acceptable. However, let's say you want to work with index numbers and household income and you don't have this little handy dandy chart that was provided to you on Media Flight Plan. An easy way to do this is to go on Insert. And in this case, you do a line chart. It demonstrates here as socioeconomical income increases here, so do the index numbers for watching movies. As one of my former students so uh, politely put it, it was mo money, mo movies, as they call it. And I, I couldn't help but think that was awesome. So uh, I was like kudos to that student for coming up with that idea. So <laughs> again, for the larger socioeconomical income, you do have larger index numbers. Thus, the greater potential. And a lot of y'all got that correct and drew the lines very well in index numbers. Um, so that was very, very good. So kudos to you as well. I'm using that word a lot today. So there's also the area of speculate why this pattern exists. And this was a little bit different and a could be a little bit um, more difficult to be able to apply. But this does help you in terms of reading your spreadsheets in this case. And so what I did and what the book kind of alluded to was look at some of the different index numbers and see if you can find patterns. So in this case, we go, we can look back at our jobs. And I went the wrong way. We can also look at education level. And so you can look at their index numbers again, listed right here throughout. And I can do the same thing here, or I just highlight, insert, chart. And you notice there's a lot of different other charts that you can apply here based on the numbers that you're looking for. Lines work in this case. And you'll notice for occupation, the line graph is pretty similar. Now it is important to recognize that these are correlations and not causality. So if you're taking an online research methods class, this is important that we cannot inherently infer that correlations equal causality because they don't. But what we can ascertain out of this is we can look at this information and say, okay, there are some patterns that seem to exist together and they are 
positively correlated. So the index numbers for occupation, higher education, and we'll notice this too, I'll pull that up real quick. Same thing. Again, as there is more education, so are the index numbers as well. And again, these are correlations, but this does explain a little bit why these uh, particular demographics have this opportunity to view movies more within this past six months uh, particular time frame and see uh, if you're you know better off in education as well as uh, money and a career uh, that may be something to consider and you can look at this in terms of a, a development with like in North Carolina for instance so like Charlotte would be a good market they have a university they have several universities uh, within Charlotte, you know, obviously it is uh, a good place to get a job uh, in terms of the amount of jobs you can get in Charlotte. Same with Raleigh. You have the RTP, the Research Triangle, that kind of thing. Um, you have several universities in Duke, UNC, NC State, etc. And this kind of approach is not only income, because incomes in cities are typically higher than in rural, rural areas. Uh, occupation which is usually pretty good in some of those, again, more uh, city-related areas, in this case, versus rural, and then education as well. I mean, this is all data that's kind of backed up, and so they would usually say these big cities would have all three of these uh, higher-end positions within your demographics here. Okay? So that's number four. Number five is a little different, and it's it can be a little challenging if you've never done this before. They basically start to say that they want to talk about putting two county sizes together and see how much is their index number in total. Now, this is a lot of math to get to one index number problem, but we're going to walk you through it. So first and foremost, let's get our data that we can collect. Scroll all the way down here. Okay, so we've got our data here in terms of the three typical types for this particular problem. So twice a month, once a month, and less than one month. So the couple areas we can look at, whoops, that's not what I wanted. A couple areas we can look at are county size C, and I'm going to shrink this a little bit so I can read everything. There we go. I'm sitting up in my chair so I can see this effectively. All right. So projected, we have 2941. We also have 2645. We also have... What's this size C? Yeah, this is size C. Apologies. 9666. I'll also put county size D. Projected one nine of oops nine oh three two one nine eight that's a three nine and eight there we go and then eight two six six so the first thing I need to do is I want to collect these totals based on estimated weight and on my projected audience here. So that's, again, gross. We know that in terms of gross impressions. We know that in terms of gross rating points is that the weight and the projected here are what we're going to be looking at. So we do C3 times 3, and we come up with this lovely number. We pull this down. We have all our numbers here. We'll do the same thing over here. And again, multiplying my cells. So F3 times E3. You'll notice up here on the bar. So again, take this um, black plus sign here. Draw it down. So we've got our front half pulled up in terms of our gross movies. So awesome. This is a good start. The next thing we want to do is add them all together in a sum, so total. So you know how this works. We've done it plenty of times before. Sum, and this is what we have for this one. Again, equals sum. I 
can write it correctly. And there we go. That's right. I'm just checking my work here. It is good. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is we need to look at our county size population here. I'm just verifying what I'm looking at here. Oh, this is provided. Apologies. I was sitting here going, how do I calculate that? That seems like a weird number, but they already provided for you. So overall adults in size C and size D. So I'll write down 30253. We have that number. And I'll also write down 30424. Okay, so I have that. My next step is going to be to divide. So per capita movies, what they say is you want to have total gross movies, which is right here, divided by your total adults projected. So we have all that data right here. So we can do this divided by, and we get be probably about uh, 54. Do the same thing here. So we're getting close to getting to this answer. So 53 and 40, or 54 and 40, something along those lines. So the biggest one is going to be index C to D in terms of our county. So combining these together, um, so we're going to do C city uh, per capita divided by D county per capita times 100. C, D, and I just added this little 100 here just for fun. It's going to be our index number of 136. So I think most of y'all got that right, or we're, we're really close. So that's going to be the main thing for that particular problem. So if you got that right, kudos. Uh, if not, you know, just check over this work in terms of what's provided versus what you need to do uh, to make this correct. So that's exercise seven. I can finally get rid of this movie demographic <laughs> Excel spreadsheet. Let's pull up number eight. So first and foremost, so this is BDI and CDI. And it's real simple to understand what BDI and CDI are because all they're basically trying to tell you is that BDI is brand development indexes which have to do, well, in this case, the first example talks about uh, laundry detergent. So you could say laundry detergent is a brand, uh, or excuse me, I'm sorry, that's CDI. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, so that's your CDI. So category development index talks about a category and that's what you're focusing on. So laundry detergent in this case would be a category. So you have your brands within that category such as you know Tide, Downey, Gain, uh, Arm & Hammer, etc. Um, those are some of the clients that we could pull from that are brands. So category, if you're thinking about this, is the particular uh, category, well, it's a category, <laughs> is the particular identifier. So again, it's laundry detergent, it's soft drinks, it's uh, breakfast cereals, and then the brands for it's Downey, it's Coca-Cola, it's Lucky Charms. Um, so no disrespect to anybody that feels differently on the uh, cereal if they have a strong opinion towards cereal, Lucky Charms just came to mind. So again, exercise eight, first and foremost, tells you that they want to, if I can find my mouse, there it is, to calculate for BDI and CDI. And so CDI and BDI are pretty easy to go through. Now, they granted, they first and foremost ask you this question to start off with in terms of our CDI. And you'll notice that there's a real distinct pattern of this being very basic statistics and that is percentages based over a, a total population. So all CDI is, is talking about a location and where the category sits within that location. So this, let's say you're doing a national campaign, is wonderful for spot marketing. Is you can look up these index numbers based on those particular areas that you're looking at. So, you know, if you're doing a national uh, campaign, you can start to look at what cities might represent 
this particular um, category. Or in the case of <clears throat> brand, uh, can work as BDI as well. So San Francisco accounts for 1.24% uh, of the U.S. total population has a 1.3% of overall laundry detergent sales. You can look some of this stuff up. You know, you don't even need a lot of advanced media planning uh, software to look it up. I mean, this is pretty easy to go through. And again, the formula is very easy in terms of 1.43 in terms of detergent sales versus 1.24. In terms of overall U.S. population, it's time 100, you have an index score of 115, which is pretty good. So, but they want to know also, what if I'm looking at multiple markets in this case? And so, let's play around with that a little bit. So, BDI and CDI, they've given us this information, and they've said, I want you to figure out based on Seattle and San Francisco, where does Red Baron and frozen pizza, so have you ever had Red, Red Baron frozen pizza before, or you've ever had frozen people, peep, well, I think I almost said people, this isn't Soylent Greens, you know, um, so <laughs> frozen pizza and Red Baron here, and we've got our numbers to plug in as far as percentages of people who purchase and where they are, so um, I'm going to include 100s, and each of those, because again, this is super simple, of all this math being a sample based in a population. So let's work with this, shall we? So for BDI, so we're looking at brand, we want to have 1.6 over 9 times 100 giving us 177 versus 164. CDI, the exact same method, just with different variables, is frozen pizza in this case over our U.S. market times 100 to 11 and 176. These are both very good index numbers. They're both very good. So it really shouldn't be ruled out. But if you have to choose between the two of them in this particular example, you would probably choose um, Seattle in this case, just because of the higher numbers for your index. But again, 176 and 164 are exceptional for what you want in terms of your particular index number that you're pulling from. Okay? So you can see the next and final question, and this will take a little bit, and so, but I, I didn't do a video on Monday, so I, I don't feel bad running over a little bit. This is going to be a little bit more complicated in terms of putting all of this stuff together. Um, and I'm going to show you <laughs> what one of my friends considers uh, rednecking in Excel. And I'll show you what that means here in a minute. So you've noticed that if you ever do horizontal problems and report them in a horizontal um, Excel cell, that they'll work really well together. So I'm just, this is completely wrong. So but I just want to show you that if I multiplied these two together, it would work the exact same way for the rest of these numbers. See how clean that is? B2 times D2, B3 times D3. Again, this has nothing to do with the actual problem, but you see how clean it is. And this is what we've been doing for the most part within this class. So I'm going to delete these. But this requires something a little bit different because what I'm doing is not working horizontally. I'm working vertically in this case. So in this case, I'm going to do B2 divided by our, our Chicago market divided by the totals to get my household percentage, and they'll always equal 100. So, the problem with this is, and this is going to look bad, is you get something like this, because what you're telling Excel to do is to work horizontally the same way you would do anything else. 
So while well, this one looks really good, B2 to B9, that looks really good. Actually, an easier way to do is this. But the problem is, is when you get over here, because now Excel says, hey, Dr. Daniel, I don't know what you want me to divide by, because there's nothing here. So you can see that with any of these cells here. I wish this caution sign wasn't here. I'm here. I know I did it wrong. So just leave me alone. <laughs> okay. So one way to do this, and again, it's kind of, uh, like I said, my friend, as he puts it, is kind of doing it the redneck way. Cause, and he only says it just because the data doesn't, doesn't look very clean. So no disrespect to rednecks. I consider myself a redneck at times as well. Ta-da! <laughs> so now you can see that it's taking these numbers here, but then working its way down synonymously. So I'll show you here. Here we go. And here we go. And here we go. See where I'm getting at here? So again, it, it doesn't look very clean. Um, and if you're really upset, like, and you're super OCD about having all these extra data, uh, you can always just copy these and just uh, take out the formula altogether. It's really easy. So I'm going to do this for all of them. You know, why, do, why would I want the data to be clean? You'll never hear me say that ever again. So this will get my percentages pretty easily. And you see I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> Excuse me. Doing the same thing here. 45%. Scroll down. And this equals my 100%. I would normally do, uh, to, uh, multiply this by 100, but I'm going to do it at the end. Same thing here. There we go. So now we've got our percentages. And this is what we wanted for BDI and CDI. Sorry, I've been talking a lot lately. I'm trying to drink a little water to keep my stuff from uh, getting a little dry here. But thankfully, what we're doing next is a horizontal problem. So we can do what we normally do. So in this case, we want to do, we want to uh, divide with our household income as well as either brand or fruit stacks. So brands and then fruit stacks. So brands is gonna be for our BDI, fruit snacks is gonna be for our CDI. And it's really easy to do. What we've done in the past here I'm gonna multiply that by a hundred. Loud email. So 82. And I was just round up to the nearest whole number. Ta-da! And again, real easy to do. Do this to the same over here, except I'm gonna do 52 over 50, uh, well, basically 55. And I'll multiply that once I find the multiplication tab here, times 100. Just checking my own work. Make sure I'm not leading you in the wrong direction. I'm not. So this is what, how it will look in terms of your BDI and CDI. So they come up with a bunch of questions here afterwards in terms of why don't you calculate everything. You've got all your percentages down. They all equal to 100. You got to your BDI and CDI. They all look good. And so they talk about name the markets with both high CDI and BDI and advise your client to the best advertising and marketing action in light of their brands. So the biggest ones that we're dealing with here are Traverse City with 255 and 204 and Lansing with 147 and 123, both high BDI and CDI index numbers. The next one they'll mention is name the markets with high BDI and low CDI and advise your clients on the best advertising marketing action in light of your brand category and potential competitive threats. So in this case, we're dealing with Green Bay. So low BDI, but high CDI. So that would be uh, a good one within the category. But again, your brand suffers a little bit here. It kind of demonstrates that the category 
within this particular area is very competitive. So your competition is going to be a little fierce uh, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, versus or another example where it's just South Bend, which is 132 to 94. Again, this is going to be where your competition is very heavily utilized, where you're not as representative, which means you can either match or say, ah, I'm not going to put too much stock in this one. It's, it's not as big a deal as getting this city. However, you might have low BDI and high CDI. Did I just mix that up? I think I did. Yep. <laughs> Apologies. Again, Green Bay and South Bend are the ones you want. Um, are the ones that you see are most opportunistic. I may have just done this backwards. No. Brands low category. Maybe I just mixed up the question. I did. I'm sorry. Um, Let's just scratch everything I've talked about uh, in this particular question uh, in terms of question five. Let's back up all the way. Apologies. I'm backing up again. So I, I think I was right initially in terms of low BDI and high CDI. Your category index is high over in this case in South Bend and Green Bay, whereas um, high BDI and low CDI. Okay, now I'm getting it. Um, I was right the first time. Grand Rapids. High BDI, low CDI. So you're doing really well in this case. And same with Milwaukee. So again, you high, have a high brand index, but a low competitor. So you're doing really well in Milwaukee and Grand Rapids. So again, apologies. Uh, I did have it right the first time. I just got a little mixed up in my head. Uh, namely, because if you can see it, I wrote it incorrectly in my book. So name the markets with low BDI and CDI. And you'll notice... Chicago, so at 82 and 95. So it's not very competitive, but at the same time, uh, there's not a high brand recognition in this particular city. And you might notice here, so like households here, accounts for almost 55% versus the rest of them. So it's important to note that you shouldn't just completely ignore Chicago, um, mainly because, again, they have half of your market here. And the problem is you're just not going to get the best investment versus some of these other cities. So you might just not invest as much in Chicago as you would uh, <laughs> Grand Rapids and Milwaukee. My gosh, I'm really sorry I screwed that up. So Chicago in this case, and you may notice again, like uh, the fruit sales uh, in terms of your fruit snacks as well as category, um, are all at 52 and 45, you know, right near the halfway mark. And it's only just because of population. You look at your household numbers, and it's significantly higher over here. But again, best bang for your buck, you want to look at these lower cities as well. So Chicago is probably your best bet in terms of you know you're going to get sales, but as far as bang for your buck, it's not as effective. So that's it. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Hope that everything made sense, given my incoherent rambling towards the end there. And uh, I look to talk to you tomorrow. All right. Thanks. Bye.